I started reading the Bible, but I just got lost in all the genealogy. You know, who begot who. Who was Melchizedek? Where'd he come from? The book of Revelation just scares me. Does anybody really understand all those symbols? Who are the judges? Like, do they really matter? I've never understood which book came first. Is there a way to read the Bible so it makes sense? Well, welcome to our Father's Plan once again. I'm Jeff Cavins, along with Dr. Scott Hahn. It's good to have you with us. How many have, of you have ever tried to read through the Bible in chronological order? I know that I did for many, many years and became very, very frustrated. Well, on our Father's Plan, we're taking a guided tour with the help of Dr. Hahn through Scripture, looking at the key theological concepts in salvation history. And today we're going to be looking at two new periods. We have already taken a look at the history of the early world, the patriarchal period, and we've also gone through the uh, Israel and Egypt period. If you have your Bible timeline band with you, we're now approaching the green bead and the bone-colored bead. That's the uh, conquest of Canaan and the period of the Judges. These are two very exciting periods. And I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Hahn. And uh, we just on our last show talked about the Deuteronomic Covenant. That's right. And I'd like to know, how does that figure into these next two periods? You know, we said that the Covenant of Deuteronomy really sets the program for Israel's history over the next several centuries. And what we're looking at now in Joshua and Judges and so on begins what scholars call the Deuteronomistic history. The Deuteronomistic history is really the former prophets, that's what it used to be called, that includes Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. It takes you from the rise to the fall of the Israelite nation. And it really represents the implementation of the Deuteronomic Covenant and then really the, the disintegration of the Deuteronomic Covenant. You see, the Deuteronomic Covenant gave certain provisions, commandments, terms to Israel. First of all, you're going to have to go in and apply the law of harem warfare. You're going to have to put the Canaanites under the ban and take the land by conquest. So the first period of conquest really corresponds to this unique law that is only found in the Covenant of Deuteronomy. Then the second period that you really see culminating with the last judge, uh, Samuel, uh, applies the law that is only found in Deuteronomy 17. That's with the rise of kingship. And that will take you really into 1 Samuel. Then the third stage of the Deuteronomy covenant being implemented is the establishment of the central sanctuary in Jerusalem in accord with the law that is found in Deuteronomy 12. With that final stage, with that third stage being realized, you really have the full deployment of the Deuteronomic covenant in ancient Israel. And then it's off and running and the monarchy begins to collapse as we'll see in a few shows. But uh, so the, the covenant of Deuteronomy really does set the stage for so much of what we have to, to come to grips with in these books, Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. To give our viewers just a little bit of a, a perspective, we have covered the book of Genesis, we've covered the book of Exodus, we have covered the book of Numbers, and now we're moving on to our fourth and fifth historical books, and that is the uh, book of Joshua and the book of Numbers. And this is the period of history, this conquest of Canaan, that is between really this whole uh, Passover, Exodus event, and King David. It's really the two books in between there. Right. Joshua and Judges really give us the transition from Deuteronomy to the establishment of the Davidic Empire. Exactly. That's great. I'm looking forward to talking about it. We're going to return in just a moment, and I'm going to give you a, a little bit of an outline of Joshua and uh, the book of Judges, and then after that, Dr. Hahn will explore some more theological concepts uh, and share with us. I'm looking forward to that. So we'll be back right after this. <laughs> Santa 
Welcome back to our Father's Plan. Reading through the scripture, we're going to be going into a couple of new books uh, this particular program. If you look to the chart to my left, so far we have uh, covered the book of Genesis, and we have covered the book of Exodus, and last segment we talked about the book of Numbers. Well, now we're going to get into Joshua and Judges. That's the fourth and the fifth historical book, if we want to read through the Bible in chronological order. The book of Numbers really leaves off with the children of Israel on the eastern side of the Jordan. And Dr. Han did a, a wonderful job of explaining Deuteronomy and how Deuteronomy fits into this whole scenario. It's really a second covenant that takes place after Mount Sinai. Well, the book of Joshua picks up with the children of Israel about ready to cross over the Jordan. Moses, their longtime leader, has passed away, which means that Joshua is now the new leader. Well, as they get ready to go across the Jordan, they're facing really a formidable foe. It's a foe that they were afraid of uh, 40 years earlier. Their parents were frightened of the Canaanites. But now it's the younger generation's turn to go into the land and take the enemy. The law of Deuteronomy has allowed some provisions, some given the children of Israel some provisions in taking the land. They're allowed to use what's called harem warfare, and that is going in and utterly destroying certain cities because of their own weakness. Due to their own lack of holiness, they're going to have to take these cities by force. And Joshua's going to lead them. Now, the book of Joshua is uh, an interesting book. The book of Joshua takes us into the land, and the first city that the Israelites are going to take is Jericho. And they cross over the land, and it's a beautiful story. You can read about it in those early chapters of, of Joshua. But once they take Jericho, their idea is really to divide and conquer the land. In Jericho, Jericho was under the ban. That means that it's utterly destroyed, utterly destroyed. And that means that nobody can take any of the booty. No one can take any of the gold and silver, the animals. But after taking Jericho, they find that one man by the name of Achan did take some of the spoil. Their next city that they needed to take was Ai, and they were soundly defeated at Ai because of the sin in the camp. Ai was sought out, and the sin was dealt with at that point. After Israel made a divide in the country of Canaan, they went to Mount Ebal, and there they ratified the covenant, the Deuteronomic covenant that Dr. Han spoke about. Now, Joshua, the way that they took the land is they divided the country, and then they had a southern campaign in Joshua chapter 10, and then they had a northern campaign in Joshua chapter 11. This only lasted about seven years or so. It really didn't take that long, and they didn't utterly take the country. In fact, there's still a lot of Canaanites in the land. After they took the land, and they are living with the Canaanites in the land, they divided the land by tribes. Each tribe received an allotment of land, and some of the land was larger than the other segments of land. The land was divided by quality. If you look in the back of a map in your Bible, you'll see that Benjamin is relatively small, but Benjamin is very good property. Some of the other tribes have large areas of property. It's not such good property. At the end of Joshua, Joshua in chapter 23 gives a farewell address. And that brings us to the end of the book of Joshua and introduces us to a brand new book, and that's the book of Judges. Now, Judges is one of my favorite books, and I think that as you read through Judges, you'll find that it's very interesting also. It's very, uh, it's very challenging. At the end of the period of Joshua, and as we move into Judges, we find that the children of Israel are in the land, but they haven't utterly destroyed the people. In fact, the Canaanites are living in the land with them. And here's the situation. The Israelites are living in the hill country. The Canaanites are living down in the valleys. Those who live in the valleys can take advantage of the latest in technology when it comes to warfare. If Israel is going to take the Canaanites, they're going to have to find a way to defeat the Canaanites using like guerrilla warfare, some other type of warfare, but not conventional warfare. Well, the Canaanites, let me tell you a little bit about them. When we think about the Canaanites, we think about a very primitive people. But in actuality, the Canaanites were very advanced, as uh, people go back then. They were advanced in material culture. Houses were made of plaster, and they had drainage systems. 
The Canaanites were very skilled using copper, lead, and gold, and the Canaanites made the finest pottery in the world. They enjoyed extensive trade. Technologically, they were superior to Israel. Now, that's important because history shows that those less developed cultures are often absorbed by those more advanced. So we could expect Israel to be absorbed by the Canaanites because the Canaanites are technologically advanced. Well, Israel wasn't absorbed, but Israel was profoundly influenced by the Canaanite customs, as we'll see in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 1 and chapter 2 uh, really tells us, uh, shows us how Israel fought off the remaining Canaanites. And uh, they, they had a problem, though. The children of Israel entered into what we would call a sin cycle. In the book of Judges, there is this five-point sin cycle that I'll explain in just a moment. That sin cycle takes place about seven times in the book of Judges. The sin cycle goes like this, and if you're like me, you can identify with it perfectly. Number one, we find ourselves in sin. For example, back in uh, Deuteronomy, Moses said, do not give your daughters to the Canaanites. They did. They find themselves in sin. After they find themselves in sin, they find themselves in servitude. Sin will lead to, lead to servitude. Servitude leads to supplication. They begin calling out to God for help. After they call out to God, God sends salvation. And then, number five, silence. So we have this five-pronged cycle of sin, servitude, supplication, salvation, and silence. And this cycle takes place seven times in the book of Judges. Now, every time that Israel found themselves in trouble in the book of Judges, you know what they did? They called out to God, and God raised up a leader to, develop, to, to, uh, de, to uh, deliver them. Now, these leaders are judges. When we think about judges, we're not thinking of someone necessarily with a gavel, but we're thinking of somebody that God used to deliver the children of Israel. Look behind me on the chart from the timeline. You'll see during the period of the judges here, that there are 12 judges in the book. There are six major judges and there are six minor judges. Some of the names will ring a bell. We have Deborah, the only female judge of the 12. We have Gideon, who fought the Midianites. We also have Samson, very, very famous judge. And Dr. Hahn is going to be talking about that judge uh, in, just a, in just a few minutes. One other point that I'd like to bring out, while you're reading the book of Judges, it's very important to read the book of Ruth along with Judges. If you look on the chart behind me, the 14 chronological books of Bible history, you will see that during the book of Judges, we have listed the book of Ruth. On your chart, that means that the book of Ruth really should be read and understood in the midst of Judges. The book of Ruth is a beautiful story. A wonderful story about a, a young woman by the name of Ruth. And here's how the story goes. A man by the name of Elimelech and Naomi. They're Israelites from Bethlehem. They have two sons by the name of Malone and Kilian. There's a famine in, in, the, in the land of Israel, and they find themselves going over to Moab. And when they go over to Moab, they meet two girls by the name of Ruth and Orpah. They're Moabites. Well, Elimelech and Naomi's sons marry these two daughters. Elimelech dies. The two sons die after about 10 years of living over in Moab. And then Ruth comes back over to Israel with Naomi. She meets a man by the name of Boaz, which becomes her kinsman redeemer. Now, Boaz and Ruth will end up becoming married and they'll have children. And you know who Ruth and Boaz are? They are David's great-grandparents. And so it's an interesting contrast. We have the book of Judges. The children of Israel who are supposed to be serving the one God, they forsake the one God and serve many. And in the midst of that story, we have the story of Ruth, a Moabitess, who forsakes the gods of Moab, Baal, 
and comes to Canaan and worships the one true God. So when you read these two books together, they really make an awful lot of sense. Now we're going to come back in just a moment and we're going to investigate Joshua and Judges with Dr. Hans. So go ahead and get your Bible, open them up to Joshua, open it up to uh, the book of Judges, and uh, we'll investigate together. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome to our Father's Plan, another segment of our Father's Plan where we are talking about the Bible. I'm Jeff Cavins along with Dr. Scott Hahn. It's good to have you again with us. Good to be here. Right now, we are in the midst of our Bible study. We've read through the book of Genesis, we've read through the book of Exodus and Numbers, and uh, we talked about Deuteronomy last time. We're about ready to get into the discussion on uh, Joshua and Judges. Why don't you give us a little bit of a bridge from the Deuteronomic Covenant to this period? Good. We mentioned this in the introduction of the show, but I think I need to elaborate on it a little bit more because people who read this portion of Scripture often get confused. We, we talked about the uniqueness of the covenant of Deuteronomy last time, how there are certain laws that are found in Deuteronomy but not in the earlier covenant made at Sinai with the first generation 40 years before. What is the covenant of Deuteronomy then? Well, to summarize last week's presentation, we could describe Deuteronomy as the law that was lowered for the lay tribes, the 12 lay tribes who were under the Levites while they were living on the land before losing it. Hmm. That was a device I used for my students this past semester just to tie together all of the unique features of this Deuteronomic Covenant because it really is sort of the springboard for Israel's future. It sets the program and agenda for the next several centuries. It really charts the rise and then subsequent fall of the Israelite nation and kingdom. As we apply it to these books, that is Joshua and Judges, we see the gradual implementation of not just the covenant in general, but specifically the covenant of Deuteronomy. First we see it with the conquest of Canaan. That is the application of the unique Deuteronomic law of harem warfare. You mentioned that in your presentation de uh, describing the conquest of Jericho. Mm -hmm. Second, we're going to see it also in the, uh, the description of the rise of kingship, especially when we get into 1 Samuel. There we'll see the last of the judges, Samuel, anointing the first of the kings, King Saul. But then Saul's son-in-law, not, not Saul's son, but Saul's son-in-law, David, is the one through whom God establishes a dynasty. And the son of David will then implement the third and final stage of the Deuteronomic Covenant, namely the central sanctuary that is stipulated in Deuteronomy 12. With that third stage, the Deuteronomy Covenant is really in place fully. And that's when the Phineas Covenant also really is triggered because then a great descendant of Phineas named Zadok will become high priest. But we'll get into all of that later on. Let's just shift back again to the book of Joshua. You discussed how it's divided up into three parts. That's really critical because once again, if you approach a book like Joshua, which, we, you know, which most people don't know very well, they've got to get a handle. The best way to get a handle is to say, look, Joshua 1 to 12, that's the conquest. Joshua 13 to 21, that's the allotment of the land of the 12 tribes. Then the closing chapters of Joshua, Joshua 22, 23, and 24, is where Joshua renews the covenant with Israel, but close study of those last three chapters, 22 to 24, reveals that the covenant that Joshua is renewing, he is renewing with some reluctance. And the reason is because the covenant is the Deuteronomic covenant. He is renewing the covenant which still keeps that lower law for the 12 lay tribes. But if you keep that threefold division in mind, getting through Joshua is going to be a lot easier. Now, I would also like to point out a few of the, the central features in the earlier chapters of Joshua. Uh, I, I heard your masterful summary of the conquest of Jericho. Uh, and you, you, you pointed out that Jericho wasn't just any old town. It really was a stronghold there in Canaan mm -hmm. that was uh, centrally and strategically located. And so with the conquest of that city, 
you, you see the Lord sending uh, shock waves throughout Canaan because once the Canaanites hear that a city as strong as Jericho has fallen, they know mm -hmm. they better take these newcomers pretty seriously. But I think it's good to go back for a second and consider exactly how God commanded Joshua to conquer Jericho because there we'll find something very revealing about our Father's plan. Why don't we just back up just for a moment for the okay. sake of our viewers. The, this is the second generation. This is after the sin of Baal Peor in the, in the book of Numbers 25. Right. This is after they have received a second uh, covenant. That's right. Deuteronomy, Se a Deuter second law, Deuteronomy. A second covenant law. They're stationed on the plains of Moab. They're ready to go in. They have not been in the land for centuries. That's right. Okay. And this is their ancestral inheritance, okay. according to the book of Genesis, as the offspring of Abraham. Okay. And they're finally returning to it after almost half a millennium, practically. Right. The so as they go into this land, they must be filled with fear because they're tackling the Canaanites and they're, and they're strong and skilled warriors. But they're not just tackling any old Canaanite town, they're singling out Jericho. Now how do they stand a chance? Well, the laws that are given by the Lord to Joshua are very specific. The Levites are to lead the 12 tribes in battle. And the Ark of the Covenant, the most sacred object, in ancient Israel is to go before the Levites. Now what is the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant was this box made of acacia wood overlaid with gold and you had the cherubim overshadowing that but within this sacred box, this golden box, you had the stone tablets on which God had inscribed the Ten Commandments. You had also the manna from the wilderness time period. You also had Aaron's own tribal chieftain staff which had blossomed and all of that was stored to show this the holiness of this of this object the ark of the covenant so the ark of the covenant was going first then the levites went second and then the 12 tribes followed the levites and they walked around they marched around the city for 7 days one time each day until the 7th day and on the seventh day, they were to march around the city of Jericho seven times. So you don't only see the emphasis being placed upon the priesthood and the Levites, the Ark of the Covenant and the sacred priestly furniture, as it were, but you also see an emphasis placed upon the Sabbath mm -hmm. and how it is following the seventh day pattern and marching around the city seven times on the seventh day. This is all part, not of a military battle plan, but a divine strategy. Because after they go around it seven times on the seventh day, they blow the shofar, they blow that trumpet, and the walls crumble. You know, it makes you wonder what that sounded like. In yeah. fact, it's, what a coincidence. I happen to have <laughs> yeah. a shofar here right, right here with me. This is a shofar that I received over in Israel on one of our, our journeys over there. And we bought this at a town called Safat in northern uh, Israel. And this is the type of shofar I imagine that they may have, have blown. But you know, we've read the story. We've heard a little bit of the description, but I think we need to hear a little bit of the sounds that took place on that day. I think, I think we, we I, do I'd too. Like to, I'd like to ask you to just to blow that <laughs> I shofar. I was afraid you were going to ask me to do that. <laughs> Let me just give it a try. That's about the best I can do. It's not that easy. <laughs> it's not a trumpet. And what happened after? Uh, if uh, God had to be involved, if that's all the, the sound that, <laughs> that came out of those trumpets, God had to be in this. Yeah. Well, I could. I could also. I could also see the inhabitants of Jericho plugging their ears and running for cover <laughs> if, they, if it was blown like I just blew it. But you know, it's it's interesting just to to draw this together because this is no ordinary battle plan. This is no typical strategy. Why would God do it this way? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are two object lessons in it for Israel. First of all, to show Israel that the battle is the Lord's mm -hmm. and that the victory is not going to be accomplished by natural military means, but by supernatural, sacred, and priestly means. So it isn't just finding the sharpshooters and putting them in high places. It isn't just getting the commanders to, to put their troops in strategic zones. It is the Ark of the Covenant. It is the Levitical priests. It is the Sabbath being honored. It is the Lord going before His people. The battle is the Lord's. But it's not just that. The 12 tribes would have seen this Canaanite stronghold fall before the trumpets blown by the Levites 
And this would have done one thing for those 12 tribes. It would have greatly strengthened their confidence in the leadership of the Levites. Mm -hmm. And it would also convey to the 12 tribes from God this message that your power is in your priesthood. And this priesthood is what you forfeited at the golden mm-hmm. calf 40 years before and just recently on the plains of Moab in wanting to be like all the other nations and not saying yes to my calling as your father to you, my firstborn son, to be a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests ministering to the nations the truth of my law. That is so good because that second generation, as they see the walls come crumbling down at the blast of the Levites, they're thinking to themselves, that could have been me. That's exactly It's like watching right. a baseball game, you know, and you watch the pros and it could have been me. But the, that's really good. Yeah, so here in Joshua chapter 6, Jericho falls, and you also mentioned the, the stoning, the punishment of Achan. Uh, and then when we get to Joshua chapter 8, we find something very significant, the significance of which is sometimes overlooked by people who haven't made this connection between Deuteronomy and Joshua. Because mm-hmm. at the end of Deuteronomy, as we saw last time, Moses described how the Deuteronomy covenant would be structured, but he never ratified the covenant. He only gave them the covenant, but it wasn't actually ratified until Israel got into the land. And in Joshua chapter 8, verses 30 going to 35, that is where we find the formal ratification ceremony of the covenant of Deuteronomy. And it follows the the, the specific stipulations that were given by Moses much earlier in Deuteronomy 27. There you find the six of the tribes before Mount Gerizim, the mountain of blessing, the other six tribes standing before <clears throat> Ebal, the, uh, the mount of cursing. Mm-hmm. And between these two sets of tribes, the Levites. And the Levites were commanded by Moses back in Deuteronomy 27 to do what they finally do here in Joshua 8, and that is they shout curses. These curses are shouted by the Levites, 12 of them, and after each one, the tribes shout amen. Now, why would they shout amen? Well, a little bit of research into the meaning of the Hebrew word amen, literally, it shows that this is the way in which a covenant oath was sealed. Mm -hmm. You know, so help me God, but as we discussed a few weeks ago, A covenant oath also implies a conditional self-cursing. I'll be damned if I don't avail myself of the assistance God gives me. Mm -hmm. So here, the covenant of Deuteronomy is being ratified by the Levites over the 12 tribes in what scholars call a curse ceremony because there are 12 curses shouted but with no parallel blessings announced. It's only the curses. It stands as a as a very stern warning to the 12 tribes. Remember who you are. Remember what you're not. Remember what God called you to be, what you declined through your disobedience. And the Levites are really appropriately suited to administer this covenant because right after Jericho, imagine how high their stock must have been in Israel at the time. So the Levites have really been confirmed in their authority to ratify the covenant of Deuteronomy with the 12 tribes. And yet in the book of Judges, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes, we see that there's a corruption among the Levites. Oh, indeed. And we'll be talking about that. But, you know, in reading the the rest of Joshua, there's a a famous verse. In fact, if you go into some people's homes, you see this on a a plaque on on the uh, wall. It comes from Joshua 24, where where the Word of God says, uh, And if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now there seems to be a another covenant ceremony or a renewal process that takes place in chapter 24. How does that compare to chapter 8 where we have the ratification of the Deuteronomic Covenant? Yeah, this is a good question because in chapter 8 the Deuteronomic Covenant was ratified uh, apparently for the purpose of calling Israel to a deeper repentance, giving them another opportunity to acknowledge their sinfulness, to acknowledge their need for divine grace, and to ask for it and to be raised up back to holiness, back to royal priestly service to the nations and unto God. Mm -hmm. 
But from Joshua 9 to Joshua 21, we see a real sordid bunch. I mean, these 12 tribes are a motley crew. They're like America. They're like any other nation in many respects. <laughs> and so by the time you get to the closing three chapters of Joshua, in Joshua 22, you see Joshua, with the help of Phinehas, averting a near disaster because there the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh are all toying with the notion of half-hearted commitment. And immediately it's nipped in the bud. But not before Phineas stands up and says, remember that the sin of our fathers, the sin of Baal Peor, has not been atoned for. It has not really been covered. And so what has happened this day is putting us back into a position of divine judgment. And so the covenant renewal ceremony described in Joshua 24 is not really understood fully until you take a step back or two to consider how in Joshua 22, three of the 12 tribes begin to slip back into waywardness mm -hmm. and covenant rebellion. And then in Joshua 23, Joshua, knowing that he is about to die, gives a long farewell address very similar to the farewell address of Moses at the end of Deuteronomy when he reluctantly imposed the Deuteronomic covenant upon the 12 tribes. In Joshua 23, this very long farewell discourse rehearses the disobedience and it also, uh, the disobedience of the 12 tribes, but it also talks about how Israel must keep covenant. It must cleave to the Lord as, uh, as obedience. By the time you get then to Joshua 24, we have this, um, this covenant about to be renewed in a way that, uh, well, it's bothersome. I mean, if, if you just want to single out a favorite verse, verse 15 is fine. Choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's fine. That's very positive. That's wonderful. But it's sandwiched in a context where there are some negative overtones. And I think we ought to just touch upon those briefly because in Joshua 24, beginning in verse 1 and going all the way through verse 14, Joshua recites the long history of rebellion and disobedience. In verse 2, it talks about how they served other gods until the Lord took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan. And it rehearses the history of Isaac <clears throat> and Jacob mm -hmm. and the 12 sons of Israel until finally God brings them out of Egypt. So what has happened here? What has Israel done? Had they responded in gratitude? Have they responded in faith, hope, and love? No. Verse 14, Joshua says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. And then he slips in a fast one. He says, And put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now Joshua would not have stated that if he hadn't been assuming all along that the gods whom those fathers, their fathers had been worshiping, on the other side of the river, the children were still worshiping in secret. So he's saying, in effect, mm. I know what you've been doing privately. Publicly, you've been saying, oh, we're following Yahweh. <laughs> we're keeping the covenant. But privately and secretly, you've been tapping the same lower powers, the same idolatrous forces, the same demonic powers that your fathers were earlier on. You can't do that and serve the Lord. So if you be unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. And then he says, the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell? These are genuine options. And you know it because you have been serving them secretly. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, the people respond very quickly in the next verse. Mm -hmm. They say, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers out of the land of Egypt. And they go on describing how the Lord drove out our enemies. The Lord has given us this land. So we too will serve the Lord. Verse 18. And then verse 19. Joshua comes back again in a surprising way. Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. He will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. In other words, 
half-hearted repentance is a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. Ponder soberly what you say today, because the Lord is witness to this covenant oath you're about to swear. And you're calling upon his name. You're asking for his help, and he will give it to you. But the price you pay is to subject yourself to the holiness of God's judgment. So the book of Joshua ends with the people agreeing and saying, all that the Lord has said, we will do. Okay. Exactly. And they said, we are witnesses. And in verse 25, Joshua made a covenant with the people that day. And it goes on to say, he wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And this confirms the scholarly consensus that the covenant that Joshua renews here, again, is not just any old generic covenant. It is the Deuteronomic covenant that Joshua is continuing on for another generation beyond his own lifespan with some reluctance, judging from the narrative, because he knows that the 12 tribes have not yet been restored to their royal priestly holiness. Okay, to put this in perspective a little bit for our, for our viewers, the children of Israel come out of Egypt. That's right. And it appears from Exodus 4.22 that, that God says, I Israel is my firstborn among many nations, the firstborn. And that uh, God's plan is that he would dwell in every home and that every father would be a priest, every firstborn, so forth. The sin of the golden calf confuses things at that, at that point. We have the Levitical system, okay? And then in Numbers, chapter 25, we have the sin of the Baal of Peor. Things are confused a little bit more. There's a second covenant, Deut Deuteronomy. Then they come across the river, and we have the book of Joshua takes place here. They're in the land. They have ratified and renewed the Deuteronomic covenant. What is, let's get inside, if we can, the, the mind of God in our Father's plan. What is His plan, the long-range plan, from this point out? What is He trying to do with the people, and how does this fit into it? Where are we going from here? Great. That's a perfect question, just to, to, to tie things together and to set the stage for, you know, an examination of the book of uh, Judges. I would say this, that this fits into our Father's plan as an extension of a covenant that he made with his people in the midst of their rebellion. In other words, spiritual immaturity confronts holiness, and what does it do? It desires it, but it doesn't necessarily want to pay the price. Mm -hmm. It doesn't want the self-sacrifice that is required to attain that holiness. And so a covenant provision that God grants to Israel puts them in a subordinate status. They're, they're still the sons of God, but they're treated as rebellious and wayward minors. And here, this covenant, whereby God the Father is demoting his son under the Levites, that covenant, which had lasted for a generation, is seen by God and by Joshua as needing at least one more generation. <laughs> and in fact, we're going to see more than one in due time. But I think it'd be a good time now to take a break, and we'll come back and tackle the book of Judges. It's great. Welcome back to our Father's Plan. Jeff Cavins with you with Dr. Scott Hahn. We just uh, concluded talking about the book of Joshua. But you know, if you just joined us, I'd like to uh, let you in on something that we're doing here on this particular program, Our Father's Plan. We're reading through the Bible in chronological order, and Dr. Hahn is giving us some fantastic uh, theological insights into salvation history. If you'd like to read with us, you can call EWTN or write and ask for the Bible Timeline Band. They'll tell you how you can obtain this. It's a band that uh, is a memory device to help you memorize the 12 periods of Bible history and 14 historical books that will take you through the entire Bible, Old Testament and New. Some helpful handouts also. And we'll be using that throughout our broadcast. Let me interject here, too, because I know you don't expect me to, to say this, but uh, I had you present this to my graduate students uh, just a few weeks ago. That's right. And the feedback that I got from them was this chronological approach to the Bible is such an essential part to grasp the theological mm -hmm. meaning of the scriptures. You know, that's why I think the complementarity of these two approaches is a kind of essential approach. It, it is the way to really get the Bible's message. Well, you know, so many of our viewers are interested in studying the Scriptures, and many of you study the Scriptures in depth. But studying the Scriptures presupposes that you know how to read the Scriptures. And I know that you have, and I've run across so many people that don't know how to navigate through the Bible. 
And yeah. uh, that, that's really what we want to help people do and give them some insights so that uh, th they can grasp our Father's plan. It you took me years <laughs> to be quiet. <laughs> took me more than years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we left off with the book of, of Joshua, and at the end of Joshua, the people seem to say to Joshua, all that the Lord says we will do. But you look into the book of Judges, Dr. Hine, and you see right away a people who have just fallen. There's seven of these cycles where the people continue to fall and fall and fall, and God has to, to raise them up. What is going on here? Yeah, when you read the book of Judges, you see in the first 16 chapters some rather dismal descriptions of uh, events that should not have taken place. Mm -hmm. Israel should not have lapsed like they did over and over again. You did a very good job of summarizing this, this cycle too. You, you emphasized how you first have Israel's lapse, their sin. And as a consequence, once you fall into the, the moral and spiritual bondage of sin, then the political bondage follows. So servitude follows in the heels of that. Well, all of a sudden when you're experiencing the physical consequences of your spiritual sin, your spiritual bondage, that's when you really begin to cry out. So from sin to servitude to supplication, you cry out to God for help, typically not when the sin is still only interior, but when it's exterior and the consequences have fallen down upon you. got caught you. with your hand in the cookie That's jar. exactly right. So the fourth stage is salvation because God is merciful and faithful. He will always stoop down to our level to raise us up. No matter how far we may be from Him, if we cry out with sincere hearts, He hears us, He turns to us, mm -hmm. and He will save us. But the salvation that He gives to us sometimes goes as unappreciated as the earlier set of laws that we disobeyed. And so there is a period of silence. Uh, the Lord gives rest to His people for a period of years. You know, it might be 40 or it might be more or less. But typically in that period, the hearts begin to grow flabby again. They, uh, the rebelliousness begins once more. Now you look at that and you think, wow, how can they be like that? I know. Until you take a look at yourself, you know. And not, yeah. just, uh, not just yourself, I think it's helpful from a spiritual or prophetic perspective to pick up a piece of wisdom here from the early church fathers because we've been emphasizing thus far how what Adam is to every person, Israel is to every nation, a kind of representative. Adam is the firstborn son of all of the human sons and daughters of God. Well, Israel has that firstborn status among all the nations. And so they're called upon by the Lord to serve as a, as a pace setter, a role model. They are to receive the Word of God first, live it, and showcase obedience and blessing to the nations to draw the nations to attract them to the ways of the Lord. But what happens to Israel doesn't just happen to Israel. The Old Testament gives us a very clear picture of what happens to one nation, the firstborn nation, Israel, leading up to the coming of the New Covenant, but since the inauguration of the New, what has happened is uh, the Word of God has come to all the other nations, to the Gentiles. And in reading the Old Testament, I think we as Americans at the end of a millennium, at the end of the 20th century, can discover our own historical progress in these pages too. Because as Americans, we have welcomed the Gospel to an extent. Right. And we have received the Word of God to a degree. You can see how Billy Graham, the great evangelist, was celebrated by Congress recently with the highest medal, the gold medal that was given to only a couple hundred Americans down through the years. So we have heard the Gospel, we have received the Word partially. <laughs> we have obeyed it to an extent. But we've also discovered the secret of selective obedience, which is really a subtle form of disobedience. And throughout our land now, in a growing tide of rebelliousness, we see how God's Word calls forth from us a greater degree of sacrifice than we're willing to give. As a result, what happens? Well, we have sin, and now we're becoming slaves to the sins that we've committed. And I wouldn't be surprised if the message of Deuteronomy, if the message of Joshua and Judges isn't experienced firsthand through chastisements that will befall the Americans hmm, who have done essentially what the Israelites did That's much earlier. 
why don't we take a look at a couple of the, the theological concepts that we find in the in the book of Judges. Uh, one of the most famous judges of all is Samson. Yes. What about Samson? Well, the judgeship of Samson is described for us in Judges chapters 13 to 16. And I think a lot of people know the story in some general way. You know, Samson was the guy with long hair. Right. And he was also the fellow who married Delilah. Big mistake, you know. He married the Philistine woman who wanted to know the secret of his strength because that strength was the key to the Israelites keeping the Philistines at bay. Mm -hmm. Well, marrying a Philistine woman isn't necessarily the secret to success when you're trying <laughs> to keep the Philistines at bay. But try as she might, she couldn't tap the secret until finally through her wiles she did. But what was the secret? Long hair. Why that? I think a lot of people read this and say, huh, he didn't, he didn't cut his hair. And so... If that was the case, there'd be an awful lot of godly men in the 70s. <laughs> that's right. A bunch of holy hippies here, you know. <laughs> but I don't think that's really the key to understanding Samson's strength at all. Mm -hmm. The key to understanding Samson's strength was the Nazarite vow that Samson was under for many, many years. Okay, now what's the Nazarite vow? Oh, good question. The Nazarite vow is traceable back to number 6, verses 1 to 21. Remember how in Numbers 1 to 10, you had certain laws that were given to elevate the Levites to become Israel's new clergy mm. and to demote the 12 tribes and the fathers and the firstborns so that they were simply lay folk now. Now, if God had originally desired all 12 tribes to be royal priests, and then instead he had given that to the Levites alone, you got to wonder, is there anything left for the 12 lay tribes? Is there any way for them to, get to, to be restored to an even partial mm -hmm. priesthood? Well, that's where the Nazarite vow comes in, because a Nazarite vow involved not cutting your hair for a period of time and not drinking any wine and not touching a corpse. Now, you know, those, thi those things might seem to be odd, but in a certain sense, what they represent is you setting yourself apart to serve the Lord. Cutting your hair, you look out of the ordinary. Not drinking wine, you're not going to fit into social situations very well. And not touching the corpse of a dead, you know, not touching a, a corpse will put you in a rather precarious position in your family if, say, your, your great uncle dies or your father or mother passes away, you can't participate in the great ritual of burial. So in a sense, you're ostracizing yourself from ordinary society. You're setting yourself apart by the Nazarite vow. Well, for what reason? Essentially, you become a kind of deacon to the Levitical priests. Okay. This is how scholars such as Gordon Wenham describe it. The Nazarite vow would elevate lay people to the role of, how did Wenham describe it in his Numbers commentary? They would be almost like monks and nuns in ancient Israel. Really? Who were there at the service of the priests, who were really able to participate along with the clergy. You see Samson in a different ministry. light then. Yeah, exactly. Once again, you see in the book of Judges, in the person of Samson, a lesson that God had tried to get across back in Joshua with the conquest of Jericho. Namely, that your power, O Israel, is in your priesthood. And yeah. your restoration lies in your desire to be brought back you to know, the royal you priesthood. You know what I see is I see, I see myself in Samson in that I have a desire to come closer to the Lord and yet I struggle myself with the flesh. I struggle with sin in my own life, just like Samson. So in what you're saying, I really sort of look at Samson as a closer brother now. Yeah, I think that's, that's true for all of us. Anybody listening in today, tuning into EWTN, sticking with a program that deals with the Bible, is obviously hungry for the Lord sure. and wants to enter into a deeper share of the grace that Christ gives us for the church. But we all are confronted with the, the temptations of the world. We're all confronted by the Philistines yeah. around us, and Israelites, too, who don't hunger for Dr. Holiness. Han, in the time that we have remaining, uh, could we talk a little bit about the fatherhood of the priest mm. in the book of Judges? And also, the Levites, as we said earlier, were elevated to a, a leadership position, but there seems to be some corruption in, yeah. in, in the Levites. The, the book of Judges is neatly divided into two halves. Judges 1 to 16 really describes the, the, the sevenfold cycle that you've unpacked. But Judges 17 through 21 is a series of appendices attached that have very chilling tales to tell. 
For instance, in Judges 17, we read about a man from Ephraim named Micah. And he sets up a shrine for his own family, a kind of uh, domestic chapel, if you will. And he appoints his own son and carves a graven image so that there can be family worship. Obviously, this worship contradicts the laws of God. But he has appointed his own son to be a priest until he discovers a Levite passing through. And when he encounters this Levite, he says to the Levite, would you be to me a father and a priest? Judges 17 verse 10, Micah said to him, stay with me and be to me a father and a priest. Now it's interesting because on the one hand, we see this man appointing his own son to be priest in Judges 17, 1 to 6. That reflects the old patriarchal custom that the father would raise up a son, typically the firstborn, and you would have a domestic religion mm -hmm. following the natural family. But since the golden calf, all of that was supposed to change. And so this man, Micah, accommodates himself to that change when he sees a Levite who is open to selling his services to the highest bidder. Uh -huh. Micah offers him a job, and the Levite sells his priestly services to this man as a kind of private chaplain. Well, that is not an altogether good sign because <laughs> the Levites are to be servant priests who are available to all of Israel, not just to the man who has the most money. Well, it gets even worse because in Judges 18, some Danites come along and discover that Micah has this private Levite mm -hmm. serving as a domestic priest, and they offer him even more. And as a result of this, they say, be to us a father and a priest. Wait a second. We've already heard that once before. Why would the Danites echo the same thing that Micah said to the Levite? Be a father and a priest. Because what it means to be a priest is essentially spiritual fatherhood. You see this especially in Genesis. This is something that really needs to be understood again today. That going back to Genesis in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and here in Judges, to be a priest is to fulfill the spiritual responsibilities of a father. This is why the church is right on target when it affirms Jesus' discipline that the priesthood is assigned exclusively to men because the priesthood is spiritual paternity. Be to me a father and a priest. It just rolls right off their tongue. Sure. Why? Because back then they all understood that priesthood and fatherhood are two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. and now in the rest of this narrative we discover that not only was this Levite willing to sell his services to the highest bidder, but this Levite, like many other Levites, he's horribly corrupt and he has a concubine. He doesn't follow the higher law, the holiness code, I should say the priestly code given to the Levites. The first Instead, half of Leviticus. Right, Leviticus 1 to 16. He is taking a concubine and practicing marriage customs that Deuteronomy allowed only for the 12 lay tribes. Interesting. So the corruption of the clergy is what we read about at the end of Judges. This, I think, is added to the book to help us understand why Judges 1 to 16 recounts this constantly repeated cycle of sin, servitude, supplica uh, supplication, on and on. Why do we keep going around and around? Why is disobedience rife? The answer is because the priests have not attained holiness. Hmm. With the corruption of the clergy comes the corruption of the people. Sure. Because the priests are like spiritual fathers, so Good. the 12 tribes are like spiritual children. It's well put. And the family of God depends upon the holiness of the priests. This is a lesson that is not just applicable to the Old Testament times. This is a call to us in the Catholic Church to pray for holy and worthy vocations, to pray for those who are now priests, to support and encourage our priests, mm -hmm. and to encourage our own sons to pray to see whether or not they have vocations. Good stuff. This is a message of great hope for us as well, yeah. but also a warning. That's good. We're out of time now, but not out of material to talk about. We're going to come back and discuss a whole lot more when we get to First and Second Samuel as well. That's good. We're out of time. God bless you all. <laughs> Nos
Será de mí.